Our next speaker is Chief Marketing Officer for Better Homes and Gardens Real Estate and leads the teams responsible for brand marketing strategy, direct marketing, online marketing, franchise, franchise sales marketing, and communications. Let's give a warm welcome for Jennifer Marchetti. Hi, everybody. I'm, Je I'm Jen Marchetti, and I'm so happy to be here. Uh, what we're going to talk about today on stage about marketing is not what CRM you should be using or how to optimize your Facebook spend, although those are very important topics. The highest and best use that I can be to you this afternoon is to help you take a step back in time to the golden age of advertising and help thread why what happened 50 and 60 years ago is really opening new doors for us as entrepreneurs and brands as mar and marketers today. But first, I want to know what I'm working with. How many of you watched Mad Men? You loved it, right? Loved it? Loved it? Let's clap for Don Draper. So Don Draper, he was impossibly handsome, impossibly talented, and I say impossibly because no one is that talented, and obviously extremely dysfunctional. But through all of that, through Mad Men, we got a glimpse into how great brands were built. And I'm going to start off with a little video that's going to show you one of Don's greatest pitches, one of the few he actually lost. It's clean, it's simple, and it's tantalizingly incomplete. What's missing? One thing. Pass the Heinz. You mean the Heinz ketchup? It's Heinz. It only means one thing. What did you notice? Well, besides the fact that every single person in the room looked exactly the same, there was no diversity of thought, there was no diversity of participation. But beyond that, this was a multi-million dollar ad campaign pitch back in the 60s, which would make it tens and tens of millions today. But it was the first time it represented one of the big changes in advertising where instead of being on the nose and hitting the consumer over the head with your message, advertisers were trying to create demand for product without actually showing it. So it made the consumer feel more involved, it made them think, and it was a little bit more sophisticated. Advertising prior to the late 50s was a dirty business. People didn't want to be in it because it was just a lot of snake oil salesmen trying to get you to, to chew more aspirin and, and, and all of that. So really, it wasn't until here, it wasn't until 50 years later where things got interesting. And I'll pitch a new chance. Well, Heinz is launching ketchup ads inspired by the TV show Mad Men. Mad Men vuelve a ser noticia porque eh, se hizo una publicidad nacida en esa ficción, se hizo realidad. The show's creator gave approval, and the ad actually lists Don Draper and the fictional firm Sterling Cooper Draper Price in the credits. The campaign will run as traditional print ads, such as in the New York Post and on outdoor billboards. Just make believe, right? That made me very hungry. the Heinz actually ran, back then in the show, the client couldn't see past the obvious. But something happened in real life in 1959 that actually did change the way advertising worked. And then it opened the door to the marketing that we had today. Think small. How many of you have seen this ad ever? Okay. It was important for a few reasons. First, in 1959, post-World War II, Happiness was the smell of a big, shiny, fast, beautiful new car manufactured in Detroit. When Bill Bernbach of DDB got the call from Volkswagen, his job was to sell a small, 
ugly, slow car manufactured in Germany, which was the exact opposite of what was happening in advertising in the automotive industry. Think Small was the greatest ad that ever happened because it changed the way marketers worked. We got smarter and more sophisticated, but it almost didn't happen because that tagline, Think Small, was embedded in the body copy. It was, in fact, the client who said, that's it, that's the ad. Now, obviously, like Don Draper, the art director and the copywriter were super annoyed at that and had to redo it, but they changed everything for us as marketers. This was about owning what makes you different, describing it honestly, and making it a way to sell. That democratized advertising. It ushered in the golden age. And the golden age of advertising is really defined by three major trends. But when you look at those trends, they seem pretty familiar. Back then, product competition was starting to heat up. There were multiple brands of cars, of aspirin, of all sorts of products. Then the new age of consumer insights started. Psychology was a new field that was starting to gain traction. Focus groups, research, that's just table stakes for us today, right? And new places to spend your money, this thing called TV was starting to get to be real. So those things that defined marketing 60 years ago are probably more true today than they were then. And that's why I believe that now we're actually in the golden age of marketing. And the difference between advertising and marketing is that marketing is broader, it's more freedom, it's more creative, and it's actually a lot more accessible. You don't need to market today, you don't need tens of millions of dollars and to work with McCann or Wyden Kennedy to be successful. But before we get into all of that, um, I want to give you all a word of caution because I've seen really, really great companies, startups, brands, entrepreneurs fail because their marketing falls into this trap. Consumers are great, they're wonderful, but you cannot and you must never assume that they understand what you're saying to them. That is simply because they're very busy and everyone's talking to them at once. And worse, you cannot assume that if you hit them on Facebook with a great post and an Instagram and you wrap a bus stop in your local market, that they're synthesizing all of your messages and putting it together in the narrative that you want them to hear. You must resell them with every touch point. Why do you think MasterCard has run the priceless campaign for over 20 years? And then the worst mistake that marketers make whether they're large companies or small startups, is they assume that because they advertise or market, it will make people care. Never, ever assume that. Now, if you go into your work with these things in mind and you try to be thoughtful and purposeful about your messages and how they go together and what makes you stand apart, even if you're not perfect, even if you lost the first past the Heinz pitch like Don did, you'll be more successful, I guarantee you, than 95 plus percent of your competitors because they're all too lazy to remember this. So that's something I learned the hard way early in my career and I've never forgotten it. So looking back, those were the days back in the day, right? And I love this image of what a TV used to look like, but Brands are built on one thing. They're built on one thing. And now John Payton talked about the trust mark yesterday, which is very real, but the foundation of what brands are built on is attention. And it used to be that a brand's only job was to interrupt what people were interested in. Why do you think Days of Our Lives and The Young and the Restless are called soap operas? They were funded by Procter & Gamble, to sell soap. That's what they did. So right now in the world that we live in, brands, entrepreneurs, real estate agents, we have to be what people are interested in. We can no longer interrupt it. So the whole conversation and paradigm has changed. And I will tell you that back then, as hard as people might have thought marketing and advertising was, consumers had a lot more headspace. 
I will argue that there is no hotter real estate market on this planet today than the price inflated, inventory challenged headspace in your consumers' minds. That is where all the competition is. So all of this marked where we were, but I would argue that these really are the days. This is the golden age of marketing because despite all of the things that we face, and whether you're a brand or whether you're an, uh, an entrepreneurial agent, you have advantages that people didn't have decades ago, which are three important advantages. One, you don't have to have a massive budget to be impactful, but you have to be authentic to who you are, you have to be thoughtful, and you have to stand behind what you do. And we'll get to that in a moment. You have so much data at your fingertips. I would argue sometimes we might feel like we have too much feedback and data at our fingertips. But if you ask the people you're trying to serve, if you look thoughtfully at your competition, and the most important thing we do at BHGRE is we spend most of our time looking outside of this industry into other industries like travel and retail, even insurance, and we try to figure out where did they fail, where did they succeed, and how can we apply that to our business? Because there's no limit to how much money you could spend and no limit to ways you can get distracted, so you have to understand what you're working with and how to be focused. So the other thing that I would say, if you play your cards right, is one of your biggest advantages are your consumers today. The interesting thing about consumers today is that, and, and we, we try to look at things now, we used to say, oh, the baby boomers and the Gen Xers and the millennials. And by the way, who's a Gen Xer here? Like, we always get forgotten, don't we? We got skipped over totally. The baby boomers took up everyone's headspace and now the millennials are like, and what about us, right? We, we're still here. Um, but Generation C, Generation C doesn't, it doesn't matter how old you are, how much you make, where you live, any of that. It's defined by what motivates you, your psychographics, your motivations as a person. And if you could pick out the one in a hundred consumers who are part of this generation who you know, hold on to them very, very tightly. Because at the end of the day, everybody that's the human condition that we all want to be influencers. I don't mean Instagram influencers, I mean real living and breathing influencers in the lives of our family and friends in our community. And so there is no more badge of honor for a consumer than saying to a friend, you're about to go through the most expensive, brutal, emotionally heart-wrenching transaction in the world, but I know someone who will protect you through it. We want to be that. And so with your consumers, you have to give them a reason to care about you. And if you let them be part of the conversation, if you figure out what motivates them, if you serve them well, and you let them feel like they're part of the process, they will love you for it, and they will make others love you as well. Let them do part of your work. Now, the thing that's interesting about the industry we all decided to be in is I came from the travel space, and I would say I think it was a bit of an easier industry because and I say this all the time to entrepreneurial agents, I could make you go to Chicago in the middle of the winter if I threw enough points and miles at you. Can't do that today. Buy one house, get the second one half price. There's no such thing as promotions. Our transactions are so infrequent. And by the way, we get blamed for things in the transaction that are totally outside of your control as a real estate agent sometimes, right? You didn't know it was infested with termites. They hid themselves. It's not your fault, but you get blamed. But the thing is, is you are the product in this industry, not your houses, not the market segments you represent. You, you're the product. You alone control the product's packaging, how it presents itself, its distribution, its delivery, its service, and its performance. That is completely empowering, but it's a little bit terrifying, right? Because unlike me, I can go in my neighborhood, I can do whatever, and if something goes wrong and I have a mini meltdown, no one's gonna be like, oh, that's Jen Marchetti. I'm never gonna work with her again. But you're celebrities in your market because you are the product. So every Facebook message, every tweet, every 
way you present yourself, good or bad, you're projecting yourself as a product. So the most important thing is figure out what makes you you and be authentic to it and never stray from it. Because you are different and special, we, we have to remember that. Just like Avis, right? One of the best things that Avis ever did was they embraced that they try harder than anyone else. Right? And if you're the Avis in your market of real estate, own that. If you're the MasterCard and you create priceless experiences for your clients, so they actually want to buy or sell another house again, own that. But whatever it is, own it and be consistent. Once you figure out what you are as a product and what your unique proposition is, there's three ways to kind of go after this. It's not that complicated. Find your story, stick to it, and involve others to tell it. Back to that, consumers want to be part of the conversation, even if they're not looking for a home. Real estate is super sexy again, right? Brad was talking about it. We all, it is the new food right? People used to love food and talk about food. Oh, I know this restaurant. Now it's like, oh, I know this great house that just came on the market. We all want to be in the real estate game, even as consumers. But I would be remiss in, in not, I'm always very conservative about warning people I care about about things. And these are all, again, mistakes that either I've made in my career or brands I have followed or cared about have made. You know, you, you have to be really honest about what your business is, what it stands for, who you serve, what you represent, what makes you you. And the way to be brutally honest is to be open to feedback, is to look at your competition, is to figure out what you actually enjoy doing and what you don't, because if anything, this business is about passion, right? You've got to love this business to be in it. You could do a hundred other things with your career and have an easier go at it. You chose this because you have grit, you work hard, and you're good at it. You owe yourself the chance to be honest and figure out if you have to pivot in the way that you're marketing yourself. Don't chase the shiny. There are so many new tools and channels and things that people feel like they're compelled to want to try. That could be death by a thousand cuts for your budget. So if things are working for you, embrace it. We have a wonderful colleague from BHDRE in the audience, Stephen Nicola from Hawaii. And he, I don't think he remembers this because he said, I don't remember this conversation, but I remember it because it stood out to me two years ago. I interviewed him and said, how did you become the top 3% in our network? And he said, I do certain things very, very well. He approached client management with a CRM and with personal touches. He took a scientific precision to something that many agents in his market just didn't bother to do, and he brought the human relationship into it. If Steven wants to become an Instagram star, I have no doubt he could. But does he need to? That's up to him, because what he's doing is working. So don't feel compelled to chase what others are doing. Be consistent in your messaging. Avis has tried harder for decades. MasterCard has made priceless experiences for 20 plus years. There is nothing wrong with consistency. I promise you, you will get bored of your marketing well before your consumers do. And give them a reason to care about you. Make them believe that you're in it to help them and they will love you. So to conclude, I will say that marketing is a strange business. I've been doing it for 20 years. I started when I was 12, and uh, <laughs> I've had a very good career. Um, have a North Star, like what you are, what you stand for, but be open to being agile. The world is changing, channels are changing, marketing's changing. Don't lose your head, but really be open to evolving uh, because if what you're doing is working, you can take extra risk. If you haven't found what's working for you, that's okay. Keep trying. But most importantly, I want to say, we've been involved with this wonderful organization for a number of years. This is my first conference that I've had the privilege to attend, and I've spoken to a lot of you. I've heard your personal stories and your professional stories. 
and they've been very inspiring. What I will say is there are a couple things that make brands or entrepreneurs fail. One, they're not introspective enough. Two, they don't have grit. Three, they cannot see the future or refuse to look to the future. Everything I've seen in this conference, every conversation I've had, I know that that does not apply to you. You're influencing policy, you're influencing your communities. You're thinking about what America can be, which is better than even what it is today. So you will never have those problems. But I hope that you take one thing away from this presentation because every success that you have, you deserve. And I wish you all the best personally and professionally. Thank you. Jennifer, was she amazing? I got dibs on that dress, so don't even think about it.